The Mays Mastercast is proud to represent Texas A&M University and Mays Business School. Mays Business School's vision is to advance the world's prosperity. This sounds like a lofty goal, and it is, but we know it is also realistic because our former students are doing exactly that, advancing the world's prosperity. Our former students are CEOs of Fortune 500 companies, VPs of strategy for Fortune 100 companies, and leaders in their various communities, nonprofits, and families. Howdy, welcome to May's Mastercast. <laughs> I'm Ben Wiggins, uh, one of the hosts of the show, and I'm here with your sp- 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 spectacular co host, Shannon Deer, the assistant dean of graduate programs. What's up? It's a beautiful day in Aggie Land. It for real is. Fall is great. Yes, it is. And we have quite a treat for you listeners today, we, we think. We do. We do. We have RJ Heckman from Corn Ferry. Actually, Dr. RJ Heckman yes. from Corn Ferry. He does have a PhD. Yes. He has spent over 25 years in the leadership development industry. He is also a published author. So, in, in The Importance to the World, he has written a book called The Talent Manifesto, How Disrupting People Strategies Maximizes Business Results. He talks a lot about the importance of hiring right, and then also once you've hired someone, developing them into a leader that really matches your company's strategy and how that maximizes profit in the end. And lots of great insights around that topic. I like reading manifestos. Unless they're posted on 8chan right, or something right. like that. I'm but sure there's some in that, general, right. but the Unabomber's manifesto, right, let's no, leave I'll, out of society. Yeah, no, but I'll, I'll stay away but from the that. The Talent one. Manifesto. The Talent Manifesto. Yeah, that's a great title. Absolutely. RJ currently works for Corn Ferry, which is a globally recognized consulting firm that synchronizes strategy and talent to drive superior performance. So he not only wrote the book, he does this on a daily basis. He said, with some of the top leaders around the world in Fortune 500 companies. And we are glad to have his insights on the show. This is going to be a great discussion. Buckle up because we're going for a ride. Absolutely. And it's still a beautiful day in (laughs) Aggie. Enjoy. We are pleased to welcome RJ Heckman to the show. How are you doing? Doing great, Ben. Thanks. Thanks for having me. It is our pleasure. How was your week? Great week. Uh, Came down here to Houston from Minnesota, where I'm from. And, um, had a great event last night through the May School with the business community there in Houston and uh, City Center. And uh, so having a great week. Thanks. Now, you grew up in Minnesota. That was your whole childhood? Most of it. Yeah. Uh, most of my, you know, born in Michigan, grew up in Minnesota, lived in Japan and Oklahoma and New York and New Jersey and Boston. Okay. But- yeah, because the reason I ask is because you said a kind of a kind of a I don't know what to I don't know how to phrase it, but you said Minnesota a little more like a southerner and a little bit less midwestern. Like oftentimes North Midwest, you'll hear the Minnesota, and <laughs> right. you did you did not say that. I've worked that out of the system. <laughs> okay, I've <understand. laughs> tried over the years. We're gonna go a little bit out of order here, and we'll start with our Lencioni team building questions. Where did you talked a little bit about growing up all over the place, Minnesota, Michigan, New Jersey, you said there were a couple of others. How many in your family? I think the core family was my mother divorced when I was young. And so the core family was my mother, my sister and I. Uh-huh. And currently it's my wife and two kids of which I'm very proud. Yes. I'm, I would imagine we just had our first uh, four weeks ago today. Actually. Congrats. Thank Nothing you so much. like it nothing like it. <laughs> we can talk about that offline uh, later, but uh, it'll probably come up again during the show. <laughs> what was your first job? You know what? I, I struggle with that one. I've had many since a very young age, but I think the first one was picking up golf balls at a public golf course driving range in areas that a tractor couldn't get. Huh. And they paid me $2 a day. And after three summers of that, they fired me. And that was my first HR lesson because Uh I was breaking labor laws for three years unbeknownst to me or the guy that hired me. And then when he was fired uh, for breaking other rules, uh, I too was fired when they learned that despite running the place after three years, I wasn't old enough to work there. (laughs) Is that a firing? Like is if if you if the, your company has been breaking labor laws by employing <laughs> you, <laughs> it's a great question. I don't I don't know how that would play out even today, but they knew when I showed up one spring at age fifteen, despite my three year tenure, I was not old enough. <laughs> fair fair enough. 
What was your greatest challenge as a child? You mentioned divorce earlier. That's something I dealt with too, but what was your greatest challenge? Yeah, I think that was probably it is, you know, my father wasn't around and I kind of always wondered why or how, or, you know, uh, had to kind of figure that out. Yeah. Uh, my mother worked. So, uh, yeah, probably just sorting through childhood without father very present was probably the biggest challenge for me. What do you think was the biggest way that you eventually benefited from that? The best thing that you drew out of what is a very, very difficult experience? Yeah, honestly, I think the the way is I had to figure it out for myself. Yeah. And I learned what was right and I learned what was wrong. And I had to learn that rather than being told right and wrong and what to do and not do, I had to figure out what seemed right, what felt right for me and what aligned eventually with the values that formed in me. Mm -hmm. uh, I had to figure that out myself. And looking back now in hindsight, I wouldn't have it any other way. But back then it was more of a lonely period, I'd say. I know the feeling. I was fortunate that my parents' divorce didn't pull either parent away from us, but certainly divorce was a lonely time regardless. So I know a little bit about what that's like. You mentioned that your mom worked. What did she do? She was a social worker. Oh. So she ran a program for violent juvenile offenders. Okay. The worst crimes and criminals in the juvenile system went to her program. Right. And her job was to try and rehabilitate them and make them more productive members of society. So, you know, I now work with kind of the the upper end, maybe the top 1% of, of executives in the world. And uh, she worked with, you know, probably some of the worst offenders and criminals. And seeing that full spectrum has provided a great perspective over the years. But she'd always, always worked hard and always had her, uh, her passion in trying to improve lives. Two questions following out of that. One is, did she ever talk with you about her work when you were younger? What kind, if so, what kinds of things did she say? And the second question, which we can get to in a second, is just wondering what you might have learned about privilege from seeing both ends of the spectrum in that way. So you can take that all in any order you want. My response would be that they're related. She would point out how children that didn't have good role models or didn't have good educational opportunities may have struggled. And then by contrast, uh, I had to see how I did have some level of privilege yeah. because I had reliable education and a stable home and you know, three meals on the table. And so uh, I think in seeing the various ranges of life and in kind of almost living vicariously through others and seeing their conditions and environment, you learn about how, what and how to appreciate your own. Let's roll forward a little bit. Give us a minute on your road to Corn Ferry. Yeah. So I joined Corn Ferry about six years ago after selling the company I was running to Corn Ferry. Oh, and then just to start from the beginning, you know, I was a human resources generalist that was sent pretty quickly to Japan to fix a business. So it was kind of an HR perspective, but then a merge and integrate a business in a foreign country, a bit of exposure, which was fascinating. Then I became a specialist in HR, which was in a large Fortune 50 company, now called Honeywell, then Allied Signal. That was a good kind of look at how, you know, the biggest companies in the world run. And then along the way, I, I worked my way through a PhD program in industrial psychology. That helped me to eventually become a consultant. And the fascination there was companies that would spend a lot of money for my services each day to help them. And they were ready to change. And that to me was really exciting. So I did that for a while, consulted, and, and over time rose through the ranks of this company and became CEO of that company, Personnel Decisions International, PDI was the name, about a $100 million company, and uh, was CEO from 08 to 13. Mm -hmm. We survived the recession, 08, 09, restructured the business, and in 2013 sold it to Corn Ferry, and I joined them ever since. They have a much bigger, broader platform. Uh, upon which we drive change in organizations. So when you moved from being an HR generalist to an HR specialist, what was that first transition? Where did you say, okay, I have a specific comparative advantage in this particular area? And I mean, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about your work with talent and so forth, but was that the direction that you went immediately or how did you narrow down your focus? 
Yeah. So I, as I said, I started as a generalist. That was broader. Right. And it, that was, a for me, uh, uneducated as I was. I hadn't been to grad school yet. Mm-hmm. And that was a follow your instincts in helping people lead better. Turns out I, I was told I was pretty good at it. And the CEO asked me to work directly for him on a number of projects. But then I thought, geez, I ought to learn more about you know, the disciplines of a more narrow set of, of HR, uh, you know, practices. Right. And that's when I focused on succession and talent acquisition and performance management, more of the, more of the broad talent management category of, of solutions. You know, that with some technical expertise allowed me to kind of hone my craft. It's funny you say the phrase you use, talent management. If anyone had said that to me four years ago, I would have thought about it in a very different context. Because for eight years, I worked in Los Angeles in the film and television business. And so talent management is not entirely different there, but there are some important differences. I'm fascinated to hear about it from a more traditional business perspective. So let's try to take things in order. Let's talk a little bit about your book, The Talent Manifesto. If you had to sum that up in 30 seconds or a minute, what would your elevator pitch be if you wanted to get an executive to buy this book and read it, what would you say? This book is about, it summarizes lessons learned over a couple of decades and a lot of research. It does so though in a, in a way that's uh, intended for a CEO or a, a head of HR to read. Mm-hmm. It summarizes the principles that separate good from great when managing talent strategically. Yes. It shares the principles. It then applies the principles to all of the aspects of HR specifically around how to manage talent in a really powerful way. And then the book closes with advice to boards of directors and and broader governance ideas on how to bring all the ideas together for major impact when transforming a business from good to great. I love the phrase good to great. Jim Collins is, is a favorite of mine. But what is the most surprising or significant insight? in the book? What, what is the thing that you expect your readers, like when you're, if someone's turning the pages and you're watching them read the book, what's the moment where they stop and look up and you see on their face that they've never thought about it that way before? I think as much as anything, it hopefully is a realization that the practices in place today aren't working. Oh, okay. I guess I say that not to be disrespectful, but rather to be provocative in challenging people who are passionate about managing talent, managing people, to do so in ways that much more directly support the execution of strategy in a business. Yes. Do so in a way that brings data that proves that the time and the calories they're burning is paying off. Okay. Uh, and do so fast because the world is changing quickly. And HR has not been known for their speed and their and their analytics, or even their impact on strategy. So I argue that there are too many things that we're doing today in the management of people that are not having the desired impact and that we're under leveraging the power of people in a business. I love this. I love this. Let's talk more (laughs) about it. So let me, so I'm going to give you something to push against. We have this massive economy and it seems to be running you know, if, you, if the stock market is any indication, things seem to be running pretty well right now. What are the most key efficiencies that you feel like we're not capturing? Because uh, you surprised me a moment ago when you said you feel like the practices in place today aren't working. Could they be better? Sure, sure. Everything could always be better. But it seems to me like you feel there's a fundamental disconnect or some set of really key dots that organizations just are not connecting what is, what's the most important of those? Like if we really got through to the root of it and you were going to tell executives, try this one weird trick is a phrase we use a lot on this show. Try this one weird trick to massively optimize and massively improve the efficiency of your HR department in weeks. If we back up just a second and, and if we're assuming for a moment, we're focusing only on this country. Okay. Unemployment as a, is at a record low, yes. right? You know, decades long low yes. in unemployment. And growth, which is the holy grail in any business driving top line growth, revenue, that's, it's the war for growth. It's, that's the biggest challenge. Because unemployment is so low, uh, many businesses are, you know, have strained capacity in, in finding talent that can execute on their strategy and drive their growth. Okay. 
So with that as a premise, if a quantity of talent is, um, is capped, then you got to get after the quality of the talent and how it's deployed. Okay. And so this book then shares a number of strategies for how to get the most out of people and in turn, how people can fully engage and be rewarded in the work that they're doing such that it's a win-win productivity increases, strategy execution increases, financial performance improves, and people are happy to be a part of it. Okay. So it sounds from the way that you just described it, it sounds like it's as much about leveraging the talent as it is about finding the best possible talent. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And, and doing so fully aligned with the strategy of a business uh -huh. and never taking your eye off of that which differentiates one company from its competitors. Right. There was a quote that we closed an episode with three or four months ago that talked about talent in the context of soccer association football for our international listeners. And the, the belief that fuels soccer's kind of outdated recruiting strategy is the idea that talent is wholly contained within the individual and that can, it can be bought and sold and moved around without friction and that it is sort of all that is mostly based on God-given ability, whatever that is. And then the idea that all of that is bunk. So it then seems like talent, if you were to try and quantify talent, which it seems like that's like being able to quantify output and things like that is something that you're interested in. It seems like if I'm working here, you know, my, my quantifiable talent may be a, a number, let's call it a hundred or whatever. And if I go somewhere else, my talent might be 30 and I might be working a hundred feet away doing something pretty similar. But in your opinion, what is the hardest gap that we have to bridge then? Like what, what's, what's the hardest part of approaching this problem in an effective way? I mean, it, let's just assume that I agree with you that there is a problem. What is the hardest part of solving that problem? Well, it is true that people bring their talents and that uh, many of those talents are transportable and can be applied in many settings. Right. Yet unlocking full potential is a, a function of person and environment or person job or person team fit. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of pieces to that. It requires that you define uh, what success looks like in an organization, in a team, in a function, in a geography, but then also finding people that can match uh, that which is required for success mm. and then putting a little care and feeding into the dynamics that create for success. When evaluating talent beyond something like aptitude score, you score on a random aptitude test, whatever, whatever test, whether it's the GMAT or something else, um, the GRE, the SAT, ACT, and grades, how do you quantify it? Like, what are you, what are you looking at? Like when you watch a group of people, like any number of folks in the business school could watch a group and say, that group seems to be getting it. Like the body language is good, whatever that means. And the communication doesn't, there doesn't seem to be a lot of spillage in the communication. They seem to be understanding each other. And a lot of that is just based on nonverbal cues, listening to tones of voice, watching how people sit who does the most talking? Is it kind of egalitarian, the way people are sharing space, the way they're sharing time? How do you get analytics on all of that, though? Yeah, so there's data on a lot of things, both jobs, uh, organizations, and on people. Right. The trick is finding the match between them yeah. uh, to unlock really high performance. Yeah. You described a kind of a collaborative environment of people teaming. Right. That can be quantified, right? People who value independence and working alone over collaboration will tend to avoid a team-based environment. Okay. Which isn't right or wrong, but if it's all about teaming in a really participatory way, there are some people who would prefer not to and will do their very best work more independently. Oh. Uh. And there are others that are quite the opposite. Yeah. You know, so sense. finding the fit between the the job, the task, the company, and the individual is where the science can come in and make for greater matches and success. Okay. So now let's say people are, you have a group that is not necessarily working as a team, but all of them are pushing toward a common outcome. Let's say you have five people that are all working on their own. 
They're not required to get together in a group, but they do have to interact in some way in order to accomplish an objective. What sorts of things, like what's one variable that you would look at to say this group is doing well or this group is not doing well? And an example I could throw out would be response time. When one person sends a communication, if it takes three days for the person they're trying to communicate with to get back to them, obviously that's maybe a sign that something's getting lost, Mm. whether it's the first person's fault, the second person's fault, or more likely somewhere in between. What things would you look at in that context? When working as a team, there's many variables that might contribute to success, and you named one of them. There are others like competence or diversity of thought or belief in uh, one another or basic listening and communication skills. Sure. But the one I would start with is uh, alignment on the purpose. Ah, and the outcome. Okay. Okay. When people share a common purpose or vision or belief in what they're working toward, they can typically overcome some of the other things yeah. like bad listening or lower res- or different response times. One might prefer slow, one might that's all fine, but what should overarch the perform and, and impact the performance of a team should be common purpose. So then how do you quantify when you're, whether people are working as a team or sort of more loosely, but toward a common goal, how do you quantify commonality of purpose? That's where I, I try to go into uh, what motivates individuals. And I, and I look for evidence of in their track record, in their past uh-huh. of, um, you know, that, that it's not an interview based telling someone what they want to hear, but there's true alignment and purpose. Yeah. And, uh, you know, people are doing a good job of tapping into that now at a, even at a very early age, colleges are looking for alignment of purpose in experiences that students, kids take at the most elite colleges for sure right now are looking for extracurriculars and, uh, class choices and job experiences and written work and research. I mean, literally for high school students that align nicely with, uh, with their own purpose overall and where they're trying to go. That too plays out in organizations. So finding and aligning on purpose, finding good evidence that motives align with uh, what people are saying, those things can be measured. And when that's done well, when the match is made properly, success is typically the result. Hmm. Can you talk about how modern technological methods are becoming successful in their ability to predict performance. Yeah. So once upon a time, there were paper and pencil tests that told us about people's personality and, and their values and, and their cognitive ability, how they make decisions. Right. Those methods have obviously gone online. So the part of your question around technology is that we now have a uh, computer adaptive testing, mm-hmm. smart, efficient, and highly accurate ways. It understanding people and their capabilities and who they are. We take that data and can predict and explain outcomes that might likely result from that person and those capabilities in a given job, Mm -hmm. which is really powerful in overcoming this issue of we're constrained by talent in Mm -hmm. many parts of the world. So we use technology to build on what we know about the psychometrics of people And we do that to predict outcomes in business. Psychometrics. I love that (laughs) word. Big word. SAT word. (laughs) How are companies using artificial intelligence to get talent right? And just going beyond like, say, a a Berkman evaluation that you would do on the computer, like, is there any way that you're feeding the results of a group of Berkman tests or strength finder or Myers-Briggs or that sort of thing. Is there anything that you feed into a program to say, Hey, watch out for this, or is it mostly just a person looking at it, a a trained professional looking at the results and evaluating and saying, Hmm, we have to be careful that, that we give our people enough autonomy, enough freedom to work just to use one example. Yeah. So On the topic of artificial intelligence and testing and so on, 
there's a lot of pros and cons to the tools that you've mentioned. And, you know, my job is to consult with organizations to reduce the likelihood of an error, a bad move, a bad decision on talent, yeah. and to increase the probability of a very favorable outcome for yes. them. Artificial intelligence, I think these days is even more powerful, less about knowing the individual, though you can mine social media you know, posts and, and all kinds of other things about an individual. I think AI is now even more powerful in understanding the environment around the organization or the job. So now we're web scraping to find, you know, when a competitor hired someone similar to the person we're hiring and what they paid that person oh. and how many people they've hired that are in the similar kind of category as the people that me or my client might be hiring. They understand what uh, we can bottle for them in what we call Corn Ferry Digital on one of our platforms. We can bottle insight around how to compete better and win the war for talent. Hmm. So again, we know what people are getting paid. We know how many people one's competitor might be hiring. We know the profiles and the capabilities they're looking for when hiring. Yeah. We know the engagement drivers of people that they might be hiring. And all of that insight, again, leads to a better win-win outcome between an individual in an organization or an applicant, you know, though we work just as much with people already in the workforce than applicants, but it also, the other win is for the organization as they get better fit, better capability, better matches, better engagement levels, more appropriate pay, and, and those then drive the win-win. What's the funniest story that's come out of doing what you do for the last, I don't know, however long, 15, 20 years and, or what's been the best moment, the best like moment that like really made your heart sing and say, I know why I do this for a living because of that right there. <laughs> you know, those are great questions. And the difficulty I have answering it is I work with boards of directors for publicly <laughs> traded companies. Yes. And so a lot of specifics are tough, but Suffice to say that it is rewarding when I don't recommend someone for a job yeah. and they take another spot. And this happened recently in a Texas headquartered public company. Yeah. A candidate was not recommended in one company and went and was furious and took a CEO job in another. And the corresponding disaster that ensued, not only, you know, resulted in his termination, but also in wreckage to the organization, including all kinds of unethical problems, and then a corresponding impact to the market cap of this organization, mm. right? So, you know, when you get it right, it, it is pretty rewarding. And then more commonly, you get it right. And what you hear from clients is, look at, you know, we've come from point A to point B. The success is remarkable. You know, literally you can measure it. And we do this longitudinally in the work that we do at Corn Ferry, we look longitudinally at how our recommendations for public company CEOs pay off. And the research is conclusive that on the basis of growth rates and profitability and hitting EPS targets, earnings per share, uh, and then therefore corresponding market cap increases. I mean, it's all there. So when you line up the talent equation, you know, with good business opportunities, you know, the, the financial results are, are very convincing. Right. And for our listeners who might not know what longitudinal data is, you're just talking about a panel where you're looking at a cross section. So many organizations or individuals, and then also over time, is that how you're defining that? Yeah, that's right. So we've, uh, we've assessed hundreds of CEOs, of uh, candidates for public company CEO jobs, right? and we've tracked the performance of their organizations. For those that, that we recommended and, and got the job, we've tracked how their performance compares to their competitors mm -hmm. in publicly traded companies where all the data is available. And as well, we've compared the folks that we did not recommend yeah. and they landed in the job or another public company job. And we compared those the performance of those CEOs and their companies relative to their competitors. We did that over time, many years. Right. And again, the, the results are pretty conclusive. That's okay. So this is fascinating too. 
what can you say about the data that you look at? I mean, obviously, you'd be looking at company financials. You might be looking at stock performance, you know, balance sheet, income statement, cash flows. Uh, that seems like it's stuff that would be pretty easy to quantify if you're looking at someone in the finance department. But what if you're looking at someone in HR, for example, and you're evaluating an HR executive? What data do you look at or, or what can you say about the data that you look at to compare Executive A with Executive B in terms of their respective companies and their respective careers? How do you quantify what they've done? What we try to do is isolate the objectives of any individual we put into or recommend for a job. Right. That makes sense. And in that way, we track whatever is measurable. And so in human resources, it might not be market cap and it might not be fair to suggest they're going to have a direct impact vis-a-vis the comp- competition right. you know, on the financial performance at a macro level. But they might reduce turnover. Okay. They might increase retention. Yeah. They might increase tenure. Frankly, they might increase turnover if change and transformation is needed. Mm -hmm. They might increase engagement. They might increase the likelihood of end up on a, you know, 100 best companies to work kind of survey or, or award. That's true. You know, so there, there may be other outcomes that align with that company's strategy that we can look and see whether uh, HR delivers. Then we can ask the CEO, we can ask peers in or outside the company, we can ask board directors, comp committee chairs, you know, tell us very specifically, and we can even measure, what do you really think of the contribution of this individual? Uh And then we can trace it back to, hopefully, why we did recommend an individual for a job or why we did not, and then therefore why they failed. How do companies, what data do they report on engagement. Uh, that, that Of everything that you just said, that was the one that kind of jumped out to me in terms of, oh, I wonder what you can see on that. Like tenure makes sense. Like you can kind of track that. And obviously the financials, turnover, that sort of thing seems like you could get data on that pretty easily. Engagement's a fascinating one to me. And a company could measure that internally relatively easily, but to have public information on it might seem a little trickier. What can you say about how companies look at that in terms of their competitors? So a couple of comments on engagement. One is um, there's a lot of research that supports that the higher probability of actively engaged and the lower percentages of actively disengaged people who outwardly don't like their company or their job. Mm -hmm. You know, if you get that mix right, that for sure leads to productivity gains, right? The more engaged your workforce in a positive way, the more they're committed, the more the more productive they are. Right. So that's clear. Where the work that that I do gets a lot more subtle is when you identify the most pivotal employees uh, who are critical to your success. And that might be a small number of unexpected people in a, in a work group that's not highly regarded or touted as the, you know, the biggest, you know, they may not be the CEO and so on. Right. We could talk through examples, but when you identify those employees that literally can make the biggest difference in the execution of your strategy, and then from an engagement standpoint, you have to go and ask them individually, what is it that really gives you a lot of fire and passion? Yeah. And how could we treat you and assume and expect that it's different, you know, for each one that you ask, but then honor that if they're in these critical or these pivotal positions and they're your really most talented employees contributing enormously to strategy, literally there's nothing you wouldn't do for them. And yet what we see more commonly is peanut butter approaches to you know, all people are created equal, which there's nothing wrong with as a principle. But when you're trying to execute strategy, you have to pick and choose. It's as much about what you don't do as it is about what you do. Right. I think it's it's fair to say that all people are created equal in terms of intrinsic value, but all people are created completely unequal in terms of preferences, in terms of backgrounds, in terms of desires. And there's... You know, there's nothing wrong. In fact, there's everything right with that. The idea of diversity of preference, diversity of thought, diversity of background, we've been led to embrace all of those things. You said we could get into examples of pivotal people who aren't always obvious keystones. Let's do that. 
Right? Yeah. What what are some what are some examples that you've run into repeatedly, or even one that you just saw once but was really stark? Yeah. Most large companies have a ton of employees, right? But when you look carefully at their strategy, how they're going to beat their competitors, there's usually a much, much smaller number that can really impact the execution of that strategy. That makes sense. If you're a company about product superiority, like an Apple, your software engineers have to be world class. If you're a company like Nordstrom, whose claim to fame is uh, customer intimacy, then the people on your shop floor have to be phenomenal right and a lot of them but again they got to be phenomenal in order for you to execute your strategy the old time example is that if you're at disney that you know this has been written about a number of places everyone thinks mickey and minnie mouse are pivotal to their success but in reality mickey and minnie can't talk and really can't do anything other than what they're led to do and told to do right the pivotal employees at disney are the street sweepers who all wear earpieces and have a bigger impact in Disney's mission to create a magical experience for all its guests. And the way they do that with their earpieces is they monitor and move people in lines so that when kids are upset, they bind them a shorter line. When an accident occurs, they move people to avoid it so they never see anything that's not magical. Yeah. When, when lines are too long, they move people so that they can have a shorter experience. And they're so happy that the street sweeper gave special attention to them. That is a magical experience. So if magical experience is the strategy for Disney and it's working, there is. it's not about Mickey and Minnie who have, you know, the difference between a good and a bad Mickey is nothing. They've engineered the performance differences completely out to be zero. But the difference between a good and a bad street sweeper is extraordinary. So it's street sweepers, it's retail clerks, it's software engineers, you know, it's buyers in a low cost. If, if, you're, stra- if you're Costco or Sam's Club and your strategy is low cost, well, then your buyers have to be world class. Right. So then let me see if, let me see if we can coalesce this into, into one sentence. It seems like... The closer a person is to the fundamental implementation of your value proposition, the more important it becomes to make sure that that person has every little thing that they need in order to do their job well. Is that right? Yes, that's right. And that would be another good summary of the Talent Manifesto, my book, right? If they're aligned with strategy, if you're bringing data to your decisions about people, especially people in those pivotal roles, And if you're acting fast, if you're moving fast, then you're going to create extraordinary value for the business that you're a part of. So for anyone out there who's listening and you want to really be close to the action, find a company whose strategy you are completely passionate about. Bring data to every decision you make. That's so perfect. I love that. Keep going. And move fast and you will be a hero. You will be forever lauded as one of the very best in that business. It makes, and it makes total sense with the way that millennials and Gen Zers seek jobs to begin with. That's but great here's news. the problem. That okay. is not the way talent is managed today. Okay. Too often times it's everyone's created equal. Everyone right. should be paid at the 50th percentile. I argue in my book that some people should be paid at the 99th percentile right. and others at way below 50th percentile, depending on their impact on strategy. Now you may not like it, if you're a part of a company that pays you at the 10th percentile. Right. But then you ought to find a job in a company where you can be the rock star. I mean, if, if, if it's that important to you, you ought to move. Is there a counterintuitive insight related to hiring performance that you can share? Yeah, the piece that's counterintuitive, and we find this in literally every organization, is that hiring managers are notoriously bad at hiring. Huh. So, and this was always the joke in, in grad school, everyone, you know, professors would, to make this point, they would all say, everyone thinks they have a great sense of humor, <laughs> right? Everyone thinks they laugh <laughs> at the right times and tell the right jokes and their punchlines are always, you know, pretty well delivered or that they're quirky enough to get away with bad time. Everyone thinks they have a good sense of humor. I just know I have a bad sense of humor. <laughs> <laughs> everyone generally thinks they're a good judge of character. And when hiring, 
you know, someone to join their team, they think, you know, but repeatedly the common errors creep in. Is this person like me? You know, do I remember the, the most recent, the first or the last experience I had with them? Are some quirky things, and they are, you know, clouding my opinion of people. So the common biases, either conscious or unconscious, which we see in the diversity and inclusion world all the time, right. they creep into the hiring position. And that's where, so it's, it's the counterintuitive piece is that everyone, most people think they're really good at hiring and judging character and they're just, the data says that's completely wrong. Yeah. And that's where the importance of data that is reliable and valid and legally defensible that predicts outcomes that a company cares about, that's where data matters. And that's too oftentimes what organizations get wrong. Mm. Yeah, I know I'm a bad judge of character too. This is normally <laughs> where I would take a shot at Kyle, our producer, but he's not here to defend himself today. <laughs> so what you're saying then is hiring managers are bad at hiring, but really it's everybody is bad at hiring. The data suggests that when the method of hiring is an interview, yeah. all kinds of mistakes are wrong, right. are made. And that's, it's doing a disservice to the organization, to the candidate. I mean, it's just, it's not that an interview doesn't have its time or place in the hiring process, but the data on, you know, one's interviews, uh, you know, most people's interviews is just horrible. Okay. Then my question for a company that is maybe not a startup, but a younger company that is really trying to optimize on this process and they're trying to figure out their hiring and they can't afford to bring Corn Ferry to the table necessarily. <laughs> what should they do beyond looking at the quantifiable information that's out there and interviewing somebody? Like how should they look to optimize their hiring process? Yeah. So there are inexpensive online tests that look at, you know, the capability, the intelligence, the personality, the derailing characteristics that a person might bring to a job. Yeah. So spend the hundred dollars on that. Yeah. It, it'll, you know, way more than pay for itself. But if nothing else, and you have to rely on interviews, then be more structured about the interview. Oh. So the data on structured interview, behaviorally based questions, checking, you know, the data from the past, you know, kind of cross validating what, what was said and whether it's true and looking for specifics in the response the data on structured interviews is certainly better than unstructured interviews. So okay. do that. That makes sense. At Maze, we're committed to cultivating transformational leaders. There is a lot of debate over the best way to develop leadership. In addition, as we've discussed here today, people are seeking more individualized development experiences. What are the newest pitfalls you're seeing at the cutting edge of leadership development? Yeah, so couple parts of that. One is about transformation, which I'm doing more and more of. I'm getting bored and tired of individual recommendations for hire or improving little pieces of a company. Right. What I'm finding though, is the constraint to transformation is, is a leadership team's ability to think uh, outside of their silo, outside of their discipline. Okay. So cross-disciplinary thinking and really pushing the envelope is critical. But from a leadership development standpoint, what Harvard Business Review referred to it as, I think it was a somewhere in the order of, of $60 billion annual train heist because uh, the leadership development space is a multi-billion dollar market and there's literally almost no evidence to suggest that it works. So when you tease that and try and understand what drives successful leadership development, five things have to be in place. Okay. An individual learner at the individual level, you have to have insight on the areas where you need to learn. Okay. You have to be motivated enough to care about and drive change in the areas that you're weak at. Right. You have to then grow new skills and you have to grow those skills in a way that you learn. Some learn by reading or doing, or, you know, there's a lot of different ways to learn. You got to know what your way is and close those gaps by learning new skills in a way that works for you. Fourth, you got to practice. You got to apply the skills you learned. You got to expect that it's going to be uncomfortable and take a while, but that change will occur if you practice those skills. And fifth, if you're held accountable for change, it happens, right? So if the five conditions are in place and those might vary in terms of how you put them in place for each individual, and that's why 
uh, training classes too oftentimes are a train robbery, right? It's, it's, it's ineffective. Uh, <laughs> and but, if you have a bad sense of humor like me, you think that's funny. <laughs> that's right. I mean, there, there's some irony in, in all that, but those are the five things that have to, have to be in place. So for people who want to change and put those conditions in place, their careers will take off like rockets. And for organizations that acknowledge that people learn differently, but they account for those five factors you know, their people become transformational. Love it. Let's move to rapid fire. What do you consider your most valuable failure? For me, it's, you know, the first 10 years of your career. So you're trying to, I was trying to prove myself, Mm -hmm. you know, but that, that for me ended up in a look, you know, I studied hard and now I'm right. See, I'm right. Mm -hmm. That's different than partnering and collaborating and listening and learning which I've come to appreciate far more in the more recent 15 years of my career. So I think that going from thinking I was right and let me prove it Mm -hmm. to listening and learning and partnering better really paid a lot of dividends and dramatically changed the impact I was having. What do you think is people's biggest misconception of you? You know, I think for me, it's uh, at at this point, you know, I've worked pretty hard and, and now I have a fancy title and, you know, people that manage my calendar and that kind of thing. So they think that I'm not approachable. Yeah. But what I love more than anything and why I do things like this podcast is I love to hear from people Mm -hmm. and I love to keep learning and growing. And so getting feedback on the book from total strangers and ratings on Amazon and perspective that I hadn't considered about, you know, the work that I had done. Uh, has been great. So I, I'd like to think I am approachable, despite the fact that some have thought that I was not. What's the best thing you ever learned from reading a review on Amazon? When people come at uh, and read my work from a different discipline, you know, it's really powerful. I had the CEO of a financial services company, you know, speak to what he got from the book. Yeah. And so again, it's that cross-disciplinary thinking and perspective that broadens my own. And so that, you know, that was interesting just to to see what he would take away from, from my book. To get outside your silo. Yeah. If you could have anyone as a mentor for one day, who would it be? I think for me that that the easy answer would probably be the Dalai Lama because I'm Christian, but the teachings of Buddha and the path to enlightenment, the more I read and hear about it, the more I think it does align with my values. And again, it's outside of my own faith. So that's, uh, that's pretty powerful. I'll be honest, the other thought I had there was, just to be provocative, was the devil. Oh. And I thought about that just from the standpoint of Sun Tzu, right? Said, no, keep your friends close, but your enemies closer. Yeah. And to understand what's, you know, on the, on the mind of the devil might be to diffuse, you know, the, the downside or the, you know, the negative parts of, of life and the world. There's this being in a book that I read recently. and. What it is, is it's kind of an oracle of sorts, but what it tells you is the thing that will implant the worst possible outcome for the world from its interaction with you. That's what it will say to you. So my, my thought, if you were to sit next to the devil for a day, is would the devil do that or uh, would the devil do something else? Right. Could you get inside the head of the devil or would he get inside of yours? I would, I would always assume that the devil would get inside my head, but maybe I'm just less capable. No, no. I mean, who knows? But uh, I think there might be some power in that. Oh, fascinating. (laughs) What is your fondest memory of this community? You know, I think it's just the experience of coming here and being here. So on the way here again this morning, you know, you see the billboard and it talks about we make leaders. That's the caption. We make leaders. And then there's a tribute to the military presence, which is so strong and powerful and wonderful about this campus. So you kind of get geared up before you even get here, right? It's pretty cool. And then you get here and you see the students and the passion and the, and especially when I get into the classroom, you know, Chantelle Vevat is the one that's hosting me in her classroom in the HR, you know, master's program. And when I can interact with those kids and I can see the future of, you know, leadership and, and human resources. So that for me is, uh, is why I keep coming back. Do you have anyone you would like to send good bull? I have an expression you know, and it's kind of a, a life philosophy yeah. and it came from my mother figures. You hear a lot about father figures in my case, you know, again, my mother, hard worker every day and my mother-in-law 
is the most giving, principled, you know, faith-based woman I've ever met. Right. Uh, her name is Betty. And the acronym of my life principle is better today than yesterday. You know, Betty would then, of course, be the acronym. So if all of us can just try to be a little better today than we were yesterday, it's all good. I mean, we're already extremely fortunate and, uh, and that will make it even better. So it'd be, uh, it'd be my mother-in-law and, and my mother. Wonderful. RJ, thanks so much for your time. What a yeah. great discussion. We appreciate you taking some hours out of your day for us. Yeah. Thank you, Ben. It's great to be here. For our Mastercast top three takeaways, I want to start with just the overall theme of RJ's episode, which to me was getting the most out of people. Yes. And there seemed to be a pretty consistent message of individualization, which is near and dear to your heart and to my heart. Yes. And that's something that we both have to be careful with from time to time. But I loved his differentiation between the ideas of all people are created equal, Mm -hmm. which is, you know, obviously we all have Mm -hmm. the same intrinsic value, but that's very different from saying all people are created the same. Yeah. Or all people are good at all things. Sure. I think one of the most interesting things to me was It sounded like, so companies have those strategic themes that are forever and always. Like he talked about Disney and the strategic theme of basically magical experiences. Yes. That is forever and always Disney's strategy. But there are times where we might need different strategic initiatives, I would say, that fall under that larger strategic umbrella to guide the organization in different directions and how different people are going to be better at executing those strategic initiatives than others. And that that's okay, but finding that fit is so critically important. He talked a little bit about we might need to reduce people in an organization at a certain time to achieve our strategic mission. We might need to create some major change. We might need to study the course. We might need to, he gave a bunch of different examples of where a company is and what they need to do to accomplish their strategic mission. And different people may be good at those different aspects. Aspects, of, yeah. Sets of marching orders, however yeah, you want to think about those. Or, or just, yeah, to execute those strategies and how... Oftentimes, I think we feel like one person has to be good at every aspect of leadership and how unrealistic that is. Oh, yeah. I'm good at every aspect of leadership. I think you're a very effective leader. I got an email from one of my co-authors last night and she said, you are so nice. I wonder how being nice fits with or helps you navigate your career. And I wanted to write back and say, I think that's the first time I've ever heard that I might be too nice. Like, that's not the message I get most often. I was hoping you emailed her back and said, you don't know me very well, do you? (laughs) (laughs) I don't know. I was thinking I'm not that nice, but I am pretty adaptable. Like, I'm not going to get worked up over the small stuff. But, and I've, I've thought about this a lot recently. You know, I think there's times in your career, and even RJ said the first 10 years of his career, he was just trying to prove how great he was. and you know, I, I think I'm at a place in my career where I can go, I might not be a good fit for that thing, that next thing, that job, that position, what that organization needs at this time. And that's okay to recognize. Right. Important to recognize. Agreed. Going back to the nice thing a second ago, I don't think that you're always nice because sometimes the situation doesn't call for nice. Yeah. I think that you are always kind hearted. And that you always try to keep the best interests in mind of the people that you're working with. I think that's a universal thing. But effective leadership is sometimes about being firm. And, you know, we, we closed with a quote on a recent show that talked about the difference between peaceful and harmless. Mm-hmm. And I would say that you are peaceful, but no one would call you harmless. Yeah, I think um, there's people that are scared of me. I have really, in the last probably even two years, worked really hard on being more patient and not letting whatever is inside of me that I recognize as impatience or like frustration. And usually it's, um, I'm frustrated with, I can see someone making a decision that's not good for them. That's usually the point where 
I get very frustrated and want to try to fix a situation. And that frustration, I mean, I, I don't have a poker face. So that frustration will come out, period. Right. So I have to start, I have to work to change the inside so I can tap into the compassion that I have for a person who may, for a variety of different reasons, be making choices that I don't think are good for them. I might even know that they're not good for them. They might even know they're not good for them, but there's many reasons why they might be making those decisions Mm -hmm. or why I had an employee the other day complaining about another employee. And I was getting frustrated because I want to say, I get that there is tension in that relationship because you need something from them and they're not they're not coming through in the way that you want them to. But do you know the 500 things they're really good at and they're just not good at this one thing you want them to be good at today? And I could say the same for you. You're good at 500 things and some days you're not good at this one thing that they want you to be good at. But it's it's hard. I know that it's hard as a, a peer to recognize that in someone else. And I just have a different perspective where... They want me to go fix that one thing about the person. And I'm like, I'm not going to do that because there's 500 other things they are doing really well that I need them to keep doing. And if that one thing doesn't come in their package, then that's okay. But th- those are times I I've, I've recognize the two things that annoy me the most are like a lack of competence around what I need someone to do right now and people talking about each other. Those are the two things I lack patience for right now. Yes. In, in many organizations, I'm not going to say every organization, but many organizations, probably most organizations, there's a group that I will refer to as the complainers. Mm -hmm. I have no time for the complainers. Yeah. None. Right. Now, if they want to come talk to me individually, that's fine. If they have a frustration with something, frustration is always okay. That's an emotion. Emotions are never wrong, but the complainers getting in a group together and Talking about stuff that has no, yeah, get away from me. I've told people, if you want to come vent to me and you're not asking me to solve the problem, I just need you to say up front, I oh, need yeah. to vent for however, I need to vent yeah, and vent to me. Yeah. And then I don't have to respond. So if I'm annoyed at your venting or if I'm whatever, I can just say, I hear you. That sounds frustrating. Thank you for getting that off your chest and move on. But if if I feel like the venting is, I need you to solve this problem for me, mm-hmm. I will get frustrated every time. Yeah. It's always fair to say to someone, I just need you to listen right now. And I just need you to validate what I'm feeling. I can always moment. do that. And I think in, in relationships, people who are good at knowing when their significant other or their spouse just wants them to listen, I think that many people would do well to cultivate that skill because your partner is not always going to be able to tell you up front, hey, this is one of those times when I just need you to listen. They're just going to start talking and then you have to kind of figure out Mm -hmm. a lot of the time. And people who know themselves really well will often regularly think, okay, is this one of those times that I need Mm -hmm. that? And then say something um, or orient the conversation in a different way. But if you're looking for it on the receiving end and you're Mm -hmm. looking for it on the transmitting end as well, then you're maximizing your... I do try to say, what do you need from this conversation? Oh, yeah. You know, what, yeah good, what would you like from me for this conversation? Because uh, sometimes people don't want advice, and that's my natural tendency is to jump into giving you advice. So I try to now ask, do you want advice? Do you want me to just listen? You know, What do you want? What's your goal? I'll tell you what I want, Shannon. Yeah. I don't want you to do the dishes. I want you to (laughs) want to do the dishes. Well, that's going to be a real problem. (laughs) (laughs) My my wife hates vacuuming. Yeah. And so. Robot vacuum, Ben. Get it. Get it for her. You know what? Honestly, I don't mind vacuuming. No, just do it. It will change your life. And. You will be like, why did we not do this? My eye is twitching. The ago. listeners can't see this, but my, I'm like, robot <laughs> vacuum. Here we no, 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 no. From not, the robot from turning, that. turning like, on you. <laughs> I, I, well, yes, there, there's also that the Skynet vacuum in my living room. But uh, no, no, I just it will change your life. It's like 200 bucks, and it will maybe literally transform your future. Although I don't, I mean, you don't have a dog, no. and I do. But as your child starts eating in a high chair, that robot vacuum might also change your life with just dropping crumbs. But dog hair, robot vacuum, do it. 200 bucks. Okay. Dbot, that's the one listeners. we have. They don't sponsor us, but I'll still give a shout out to Dbot. Not yet. Mm-hmm. Give us a call. <laughs> Mastercast at Maze. 
No, Mastercast. <laughs> and Mastercast Mays, at Maze <laughs> Mastercast at gmail.com. Right. For our second top three takeaway, I definitely was, it just struck me in the episode again, the cost of hiring someone who's not a good fit and how costly that is to the person and how costly that is to the organization. Yep. Because it's so hard to move on. And, you know, you even pushed back a little bit with RJ on, okay, there are some people you and I can go and find a different job because we have marketable skills. And there are other people who can't do that as easily. But I would even say just the more risk adverse part of me, the one that doesn't jump off of cliffs into water and skydive and those things, mm. the the financial part, the part of me that is very risk adverse from a financial perspective, because mm -hmm. that's my biggest fear yeah. is, I mean, changing an organization would be so hard and even changing a position is hard, you know, all of those things. And so finding the fit up front and being willing to say no to an opportunity that sounds appealing for a lot of reasons, but isn't a good fit is so important from a personal perspective. And then the same on the organization side sometimes, and he talked about the scarcity of human talent. Sure. And especially when unemployment rates are low and we might want to rush through the hiring process because, man, if I can just hire someone for that position, my life will be easier. But hiring the wrong person just is a, is a costly long-term mistake. Something that I didn't think about during the interview, but I'm thinking about it now as we talk about hiring when unemployment is low it seems like organizations that would thrive the most in terms of maximizing their talent are organizations that are best able to hire talent that already has a job. Um, yeah. And I wonder how that's different. You know, the organizations that are the best at that are not necessarily the organizations that are going to be the best at pulling talent out of a very available market, i.e. people who don't mm -hmm. currently have a job. But it seems like in the executive world, most people are probably employed right. most of the right. time. I think at the at the higher level positions within a company, you're oftentimes hiring employed people. Right. Sure. So maybe that doesn't change as much when the employment market is really strong. Right. I don't know. Yeah. I, don't, I don't. We'd have to ask RJ. Yeah. Dang sure. it. He and left already. An opportunity lost. <laughs> <laughs> but I did think too with the the hiring process, he talked so much about aligning the hiring process with your overall corporate strategy yeah. that people need to have buy-in around that passion around it, just be aligned in their skill sets. And that also means that the company needs to be very clear on what their strategic vision is or organization sure. needs to be very clear, regardless of the size of the organization, having clarity around your strategic vision, your corporate strategy is so important. Right. If it drives everything that the company does and hiring drives everything that the company does, then knowing that strategy, being able to communicate it and find people that are willing to buy into it is, is critical. Yeah. For our third Mastercast takeaway, I wanted to talk a little bit about what he said with the use of tools for hiring. Right. So using more objective tools rather than just an interview, because we are every time biased always bias, even if we're trying not to be. There's a lot of data that shows we hire people that look like us, that act like us, talk like us, yes. talk like us and then you create these non-diverse groups within right. organizations. Yep. So he talked about, you know, you actually mentioned Corn Ferry is really expensive and not every company can afford them. He was like, yeah. He also said after, he, after we stopped recording that Corn Ferry does have some less expensive tools. So you can check those out if you're an organization yep. really on a budget. Please do. But he did say spend $100 on some of those leadership assessments, personality assessments. Even we have one that all of our students take when they come in called Career Leader. And it assesses things like what is important to you in a job. Autonomy, being part of a team, having flexibility, those are the ones that are mine, so I can't remember any of the other financial ones. Financial downside, financial sure. upside. Yeah, mission I, of the organization, all right, of those things. Right, so right. you can do assessments that don't take candidates a long time to complete, right. that don't take you a long time to review, that will give you better data than an interview that is a biased experience. I, I still have my career leader assessment 
and I saved it as an unread email mm. and it will live in my inbox forever. Mm. And I also have a printout of it in, I believe, in my backpack mm-hmm. that I used for the MBA program. Yeah. Um, it was spot the heck on. Right. Mine too, yeah. for sure. So. RJ talked about the importance of structured interviews. Yeah. So at Texas A&M, we are required to ask every candidate the same interview questions. We're supposed to do the interview in the same room with the same people. Okay. So it is quite structured in that we're not throwing something different at each candidate so we can more objectively measure. I'm not saying that that is a perfect tool. As RJ said, bias still comes into that. So using something else is good. Mm -hmm. But but he basically said, if it's your only option, at least do a structured interview. Don't do unstructured interviews. Right. And and that seems to be as much as anything about standardization. Absolutely. Well, yeah, standardization and trying to filter out some of your biases, right? Right. We want to do a bonus takeaway real quick. I loved what he said about the Betty acronym and better today than yesterday. I just thought that was really cute. When he first said that, I was like, what does the E stand for? And then I was like, you idiot. It's just B-T-T-Y. Right, right, right. No, I did. I did have to process that for a couple of seconds. It's like, well, B better is has a lot of E's. No, it's just B-T-T-Y. Yeah. Super cute. Yeah. Ryan and I have a Betty in our life who we really, really love. Um, So shout out to our Betty, who's like an adopted grandmother, Betty Abel. Lovely. Ben, would you like to close us out with a quote? I would like to close uh, close us with a close quote. Us, close us I with a quote? I would like to close us with a quote. <laughs> Qu- quote, quote. <laughs> it is possible that even after your descent into your inner self and your secret place of solitude, you might find that you must give up becoming a poet. As I have said, to feel that one could live without writing is enough indication that in fact one should not. Even then, this process of turning inward, upon which I beg you to embark, will not have been in vain. Your life will no doubt from then on find its own paths, that they will be good ones and rich and expansive. That I wish for you more than I can say. Reiner Rilke. Love it. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.